there once was a young man named Pierre Gint. He was a laughing stock in his hometown. He was hot-headed, selfish, and a compulsive liar who told fanciful stories. One day, he went to a wedding. There, he met the most beautiful girl in the world. He knew the instant he saw her that he was in love. The girl's name was Solvig. However, Solvig had heard of his reputation and shunned him. Despondent, Pierre drank heavily and was taunted by the other guests. Suddenly the guests saw Pierre Gint fleeing up the mountain with the bride, Ingrid, over his shoulder. Abandoning the bride, he went deep into the wilderness and came across a woman dressed in green. She claimed to be the daughter of the Troll Mountain King, and together they rode to the mountain hall. Pierre Gint arrived at the Hall of the Mountain King. He was surrounded by many ugly trolls, captured and taken to the king. At first, the king was displeased to have an intruder in his kingdom, but Pierre assured him that he was simply looking for a new home and perhaps he would be allowed to live there. The king found that he liked the young man and suggested that he could marry his daughter. She was beautiful, but not as pretty as Solvi. The king told Pierre he would have to become a troll to marry his daughter. That night, when he was alone in his bedroom, Pierre began to think about the king's plan. He decided he did not want to become a troll, but now he had a problem. How could he say no to the king without making him very angry? He decided he had better sneak out of the mountain right then, while it was still dark. He filled his pockets with jewels and tiptoed through the halls, so very quietly. But the troll guards heard him and gave chase. At last, the trolls started to surround Pierre. They captured him and found the gold and the jewels that he had stolen from the king. He was put in prison. But he escaped and headed deeper into the mountains. There he came upon the great Boig, a monster with no shape or form. Repeatedly he tried in vain to find a passage past the monster to the mountain top. In desperation he challenged the monster to a fight. It replied, I win without a fight. I win every time. Pierre fought hard and long, but time and again he was defeated. Large birds arrived to devour his corpse. 
Suddenly, church bells and women's voices were heard in the distance. Your hymnals, Pia cried, throw them into his eye. Look, he's staggering. The boy capitulated. He was too strong for me, especially with the women behind him to help him in the fight. Pierre built himself a hut in the forest. Solvig came to stay. When they asked where I was going, she told him, I said I was going home. This is where I belong. Before long though, the woman in green appeared with a limping, sickly child. This is your son, she told Pierre, and refused to leave. The two could not be driven away, so Pierre, taking his usual course of action, decided to leave himself. He told Solvik that he had a very heavy duty and returned home to his mother. His mother was gravely ill and lying in the bed where he had slept as a little boy, where he and she once played that the bed was a sleigh and sped to the castle west of the moon and the castle east of the sun. He told her that the king was giving a feast and that she was invited. They were welcomed with the greatest honour, with cakes and wine. He looked down and saw that she was dead. He closed her eyes. Thank you for the beatings and the lullabies. And so Pierre was off again to wander over the world. For 20 years he travelled far and wide, America, China, Italy, France and England. He decided to learn the secret of the great Sphinx of Egypt. But he was in Morocco and had to cross the desert on his four-legged ship, a bad-mannered camel who grunted and groaned and spat. One night, he shared a meal with some friendly Bedouins. The chieftain clapped his hands, let the entertainment begin, and a beautiful girl began to dance. Her name was Anitra, and she stared at Pierre, mesmerised by his strange words and foreign face. But she was also mesmerised by the jewels in his stolen turban. On and on she danced, with the glint of wealth flashing in her eyes like fire. When Pierre woke the next morning, the Bedouins, Anitra, and his turban were gone. He and his camel plodded on to Egypt. As he addressed the Sphinx, he encountered the keeper of the local madhouse, himself insane who regarded Pierre as the bringer of supreme wisdom. Pierre went to the madhouse and saw that all of the patients lived in their own worlds, being themselves to such a degree that no one cared for anyone else. 
In his youth, Pierre had dreamed of becoming an emperor. In this place, he was finally hailed as one. Now he had had enough adventuring and hoped for a serene old age at home. He boarded a boat bound for Norway. But there was a storm brewing. The boat was tossed to and fro. Pierre clung to the mast. But it was too late. The boat was smashed against some rocks. Baited, and Pierre, with his usual luck, had made it ashore. He tramped for many days over the mountains to his village, but he had been away for so long that he was now a stranger. No one knew him. He came to the hut of his father and mother, the very place where he was born. There he had sat on his mother's lap, there his father had told him stories. There he had played with his cat and dreamed of fairy kingdoms and flights of fancy. But now that he was old, what had he done with his life? He thought of all the things that he did not do. His unsung songs, his unmade work, his unwept tears, and his questions that were never asked. Had he done anything serious? Peer despaired understanding that his life was almost done, that in the end, he was nothing. But at that moment, Solvi began to sing. The cabin he had built himself was close by. Where have I been since we last met, he asked her. She answered, in my faith, in my hope, in my love. And sang him a lullaby. 